Once we've got partial derivatives, directional derivatives, and the gradient, we can understand the rate of change of a function of several variables in any direction that we want to push the input into. And uh, once we can understand the rate of change in basically any direction we want, it is very natural to start thinking about how to find relative maxima and minima of functions. Because in some ways we're, of course, at exactly the same point as we were at in single variable calculus after we introduced the derivative for a function of one variable. And after we had done that, one of the time-honored applications was to find relative maxima and minima of functions of one variable. So let's see how this goes for multivariable functions. Well, we start, as is so often the case in a mathematics class, with a definition. And a multivariable function has a local or relative maximum at the point m, for which I'm writing down the position vector here, uh, at that point m, if and only if there is an epsilon greater than zero, so that uh, f of r is smaller than f of m for all r that are so that r minus m, the norm of that, is smaller than epsilon. Basically, a multivariable function has a local or relative maximum if and only if in a small neighborhood around that place m. And that's basically what we're talking about when we're saying there's a small radius, basically, around this m so that anything that falls within that circle or ball or uh, multi-dimensional ball, n-dimensional ball, around m that anything that falls in that ball when we plug that into the function f we get a smaller value than what we get at the center. This definition is basically the same definition as for local and relative maxima uh, of functions of one variable only that we uh, formulated it here very much like it would be formulated in an advanced text already because we're further along. Uh, but other than that, you could just replace multivariable function with function, norms with absolute values, and you would have exactly the definition of a local or relative maximum at a point. Now what we of course want to visualize is that local or relative maxima are locally highest points, and uh, that's what these four uh, peaks here certainly show, and with this visualization in front of us, we can look at this definition one more time. Basically, around any of these peaks, I could, in the domain, draw a small circle so that the peak really literally is the highest point in uh, within that small circle around the peak. However, it could be, and that's what we're talking about, local or relative maxima, it could be that there are higher peaks somewhere else. So that's why this one is a relative maximum, this one is a relative maximum, this one is a relative maximum. That one here, unless this mountain range has uh, some further peaks outside this picture, this one would be the absolutely highest point. And we will talk about absolute extrema and optimization applications in the next presentation. Right now we just want to try to understand how to find these relative extrema. And one thing that we note is that at these locally highest points, if we were to fit a tangent plane to these locally highest points, there should be a horizontal tangent plane. And we know that horizontal tangent planes are associated with gradients that are zero. So just as in single variable calculus, if there is a relative maximum at a certain point, the derivative ought to be zero. If there is a relative maximum at a point in for a multivariable function, then the gradient should be zero at that point. And of course, all of this also has corresponding results for local or relative minima, where basically the picture is just flipped upside down. And, and when it's upside down, then these things would be relative minima, right? OK, so theorem. If a multivariable function has a local maximum or a local minimum, which is defined uh, very much the same way, only that the point has to be locally the smallest point. If it has a local maximum or a local minimum at the point m, and f is differentiable at the point m, then the gradient of f at m must be zero. And the proof is actually fairly simple because, uh, well, first of all, we can assume without loss of generality that, that f has a local 
maximum at m, otherwise we would just consider minus f, and the gradient of minus f being 0 would be the same as the gradient of f being 0. And what we must show is that the gradient is 0, which means we must show that all the partial derivatives, partial derivative of f with respect to xi, are all equal to 0 at m. And, uh, well, we just let ei be the ith unit vector, so that's the vector that has zeros in all, co zeros in all components except for the ith one. And uh, for any i, then, the function g of t, being f of m plus t times ei, has a local maximum at t equals 0. Because what do we know? We know that f has a local maximum at m, which means if we only introduce a small distortion to going, uh, so we, we just go away from the point m just a little bit, then we will go downwards independent of which direction we take, and so in particular if we take a small step in the i-th coordinate direction forwards or backwards, the function will uh, assume smaller values, and that means that the function has a local maximum at t equals zero. Basically what we're doing here is we're taking a slice where we are slicing with a vertical plane that is parallel to the i-th unit vector, right? And that slice then, of course, is a function of one variable, and if the function of several variables has a local maximum at m, then the function of one variable that is obtained as a slice must also have a local maximum in that same location. All right, once we've got this reduced to a single-valued function of one variable, namely a variable t, we know that we can use single variable calculus to conclude that 0 must be equal to the derivative with respect to t of the function f of m plus t times ei at t equals 0. And we know how to take this derivative with the chain rule. That's the gradient of f at m dot ei, because the chain rule will have to say, uh, will tell us that to take the derivative of this composition, we take the gradient of f and then we multiply with the t derivative of the inside and the t derivative of the inside is just ei. But of course the gradient of f at m dot ei, that's just the partial derivative of f at xi uh, with rest in the xi direction at m and so that is what we wanted to prove and so because i was arbitrary now all partial derivatives are zero at m and that is what we wanted to prove. So basically in terms of trying to remember it for single variable functions, if there is a local maximum or a local minimum, the derivative must be zero. And for a multivariable function, if there is a local maximum or a local minimum at a point, the gradient must be equal to zero. So let's take a look at another definition here. Yeah, of course, once we've got this theorem, a point is called a critical point of the multivariable function f if and only if the gradient is equal to zero at that point. And so now let's take a look at an example, and this will only be the start because uh, basically we want to find the critical points of the function f of xy equals x to the fourth plus y to the fourth minus 36xy, and we want to determine if they are local man minima, local maxima, or neither. And to do that, we will ultimately use the second derivative test. So here, we're just going to start and find the critical points. Well, we take the gradient, and the gradient is, of course, that we take the x-partial and the y-partial of our function. So that would be in the x-component, we would get 4x cubed minus 36y. And in the y-component, we would get 4y cubed minus 36x. And that's exactly what we get. And for a critical point, the gradient must be equal to 0. That gives us two equations, namely 4x cubed minus 36y equals 0 and 4y cubed minus 36x equals 0. So those are two nonlinear equations for two variables, and there really is, unlike for systems of linear equations, there is no set algorithms how to solve systems of nonlinear equations. So we basically are back to just using our wits, and in this case, the substitution method. So I think I want to take this equation, and I want to solve it for y. Yeah, and so first of all, I bring the 36y over and flip sides, so I get 36y equals 4x cubed, and that tells me that y is 1 ninth x cubed, and now I can take this and plug it into this equation. So that equation was 4y cubed minus 36x equals 0, 
and that means that 4 times 1 9th x cubed cubed minus 36x is equal to 0. And what do we get out of that? Let's see. The 4 I can actually cancel, right? Because 36 is also divisible by 4. So if I cancel the 4, I end up with a 9x here. And if I then multiply with a 9 cubed, I get 9 to the 4th x here. And x cubed cubed is x to the 9th. So we end up with x to the 9th minus 9 to the 4th x equals 0, which is, of course, a ninth order equation. But it's actually a bearable one, a solvable one. Because if x to the 9th minus 9 to the 4th x is equal to 0, that means that x times x to the 8th minus 9 to the 4th must be equal to 0. That gives us trivially or near trivially that x is equal to 0. And then x to the 8 minus 9 to the 4th must be equal to 0. That's the same as x to the 8 minus 3 to the 8th being equal to 0. And so taking 8th roots uh, gives us that x can be equal to 3 or x can be equal to minus 3. And we remember that y is equal to 1 9th x cubed. And that means that x equals 0 goes with a y coordinate of y equals 0. x equals 3 goes with a y coordinate of 1 9th times 27, which is 3. And x equals negative 3 corresponds to a y coordinate of 1 9th times negative 27, which is negative 3. Because Unlike in single variable calculus, where a critical point was given by one coordinate for a function of two variables, of course, a critical point is given by two coordinates, by a coordinate pair x, y. And so we've got one critical point there. We've got a second critical point here. And 0, 0 is the third critical point. So this is the first stopping point, in a way, in this presentation. To find critical points, you set the gradient equal to 0, you have to solve a system of nonlinear equations, and you must come out with points that match the dimensions of your input, right? If this had been a function of three variables, I would have had to compute triples x, y, z in order to find the critical points. Okay, however, now that we have these critical points, we know that these points are candidates for maxima, minima, but they could also be saddle points. They could also be neither a maximum nor a minimum, right? Because just like what we have seen in single variable calculus, just because the derivative is zero doesn't tell us whether it's a maximum or a minimum. And functions such as x cubed in single variables, f of x equals x cubed, are also so that even though the derivative is zero at the origin, it is neither a maximum nor a minimum. So we need a way to determine uh, which is which. And in single variable calculus, I typically prefer to determine where the function is increasing and where it's decreasing and find out the maximum and minima from that. In multivariable calculus, that gets really, really hard, of course, because we've got plenty of directions in which the function could increase or decrease. And so in multivariable calculus, the second derivative test really becomes something of a lifesaver here. And the theorem is the following. The second derivative test for functions of two variables uh, is something where we suppose that f of x and y has continuous second partial derivatives near the point a, b, and that the gradient of f at a, b is equal to 0. If the second partial of f with respect to x times the second partial of f with respect to y minus the square of the mixed partial with respect to x and y, all of those at a, b. If this expression is greater than 0 and the second partial with respect to x at a, b is greater than 0, then f has a local minimum at a, b. OK, now this is technical, right? This is the part that's probably a bit scary right now, and we're going to talk about that part separately. So let's for now just um, just take this as something that somebody really smart has figured out. And let's look at f sub x, x of a, b. Well, that is the second partial derivative in the x direction that indicates concavity in the x direction. And so uh, if the second partial derivative in the x direction is greater than 0, that means that the function is concave up. And we know that if we've got derivative 0, and the function is concave up, then there is a local minimum at that point. We know that from single variable calculus. And so 
that something like this would work in multivariable calculus the same way, that should not be too surprising. Uh, if this uh, expression here, fx, x, f, y, y minus f, x, y quantity squared is still greater than zero and the second x partial is smaller than zero at a, b, well, that would mean that the function is concave down, right? And when the, the derivative is zero and the function is concave down, we expect that to have a local maximum, and that is indeed the case. And uh, if the expression fx, x, f, y, y minus f, x, y quantity squared is smaller than zero, then a, b is neither a minimum nor a maximum. So that's when it's a saddle point. Uh, so, and we also will say then that a, b is a saddle point. And if f, x, x, f, y, y minus f, x, y squared is equal to zero, we can't decide whether the function is a min uh, has a minimum, a maximum, or a saddle point at a, b, and so then more uh, uh, further investigation is necessary, and that would mean that we need more advanced mathematics there. Okay, so what this theorem as well as its ending are telling us is that the finding of relative extrema for functions of several variables is going to be a very sophisticated process. Note also that I'm only stating this theorem for functions of two variables, and that's because we literally don't have the machinery right now to state this theorem for functions of three variables or more variables. Along the same lines, we're also not going to prove this theorem here, but we certainly want to get a geometric understanding of these conditions. So let's see if we can explain the condition fx, x, f, y, y minus f, x, y squared greater than zero, as well as the condition on the sign of the second x partial derivative, where, of course, we already have talked about the sign of the second x partial derivative a little bit. That tells you whether things are concave up or concave down and that then in distinguishes maxima from minima. And that's also uh, in the formulation of the theorem that the sine of fxx distinguishes whether we've got a maximum or a minimum. So let's think about the pieces. Let's first think about the product of the second partial derivatives in the x direction and in the y direction. Basically, what the second partial derivative in the x direction direction measures is concavity in the x direction, and the second partial derivative in the y direction measures concavity in the y direction. And when their product is greater than zero, that means that they're either both positive or they are both negative, and that means the concavities go in the same direction, and that is important. Let's take a look at a situation where f x x f y y is greater than zero. This function I think we can easily see that the x slices, the x slices are concave down, the y slices are concave down, which means fxx and fyy are smaller than zero and their product is greater than zero, and that means we have a chance here for this function to have a maximum. Of course, if fxx and fyy are both positive, then the product is also greater than zero, but that would be something where this thing would be upside down and we would have a relative minimum. Now, what can happen when the product is smaller than zero? Well, here's a function for which the product of the uh, second x derivative and the second y derivative is smaller than zero at this saddle point here, which we can really see that that even looks like a saddle, right? So what happens here is that if we go along the x-axis, we have that the function is concave down, concave up. Come on, that's just, <laughs> that's up. I mean, I'm even moving the mouse up and I'm saying down. I apologize. Um, so along the x direction, the function is concave up. Along the y direction, the function is concave down. That means fxx is positive, fyy is negative. So the product of a positive and a negative number is negative. And what that means is that when that happens, we have a situation where the concavities just don't match with each other. One concavity wants to cause a local maximum, the other one would, wants to cause a local minimum, and that means we end up with a saddle point. So that means if we want to have any chance at all to have a maximum or a minimum, we must have that the product of the axial concavities is greater than zero. Okay, so now how does that other factor come in? Because what we actually talk about is not just 
the product of the, of the concavities, but also a subtraction of the x, f x y squared, right? Okay, so basically, if this whole thing is greater than zero, then in particular you must have that f x x f y y is greater than zero, which we have just seen is a dire necessity to have a maximum or a minimum. But what could then still happen is you could have a situation where a function has, uh, say, concavity up along both the x-axis and the y-axis, and this mixed partial derivative, which uh, tells us always that the function is warping in a certain way, this warp might still overcome the concavity along the axes. And so this condition then basically says that the warp is, if this remains greater than zero, then the warp is not strong enough to turn what seems to be a maximum or a minimum, or what wants to be a maximum or a minimum, or a minimum into something that uh, is a saddle point. And so talking about it the other way around, it can happen with a function that has, uh, that has the same concavity along both axes that the warp could still overcome the axial concavity because remember the partial derivative, the mixed second partial derivative fxy is something that tells us how fast the tangent lines tilt along the axes and so even though if you were to look at this function from, from various angles, this function has concavity up in both directions because I've just um, just really, really uh, emphasized the tangent lines. The fact that the tangent lines tilt at a, at a too fast a speed means that this function still has a saddle point even though the second x partials and the second y partials have the same, uh, have, have a positive product. And uh, well, then the sign of the axial concavity determines whether it's a maximum or a minimum. So basically what this says is that there is quite a bit of stuff that can happen and must go right in several dimensions so that we actually have a maximum or a minimum. Namely, the axial concavities might, must line up and they must line up and the warp must not be stronger than axial concavity. And that's basically what this condition says, and once this condition says that, then the sine of fxx can, can be used to determine whether it's a maximum or a minimum. Now, of course, if this thing is smaller than zero, then either the axial concavities don't line up, and that's where under number one we have seen we would end up with a saddle point, or it could be that the axial concavities line up, but they are overcome by the warp, and under point two, we have seen that that also ends up leading to a saddle point. And the part that then really goes into much more sophisticated things that we typically cannot address in a calculus class, if these guys line up and the warp, uh, if, uh, if this is an equality, so if, if this term is equal to zero at our critical point, well, then more analysis is needed. Let's hope we don't need that for our example, and I can tell you we won't need that for that example, so let's conclude this thing. Remember, we wanted to find the critical points of the function f of xy being x to the fourth plus y to the fourth minus 36xy, and we wanted to determine if they are local minima, local maxima, or neither. Well, it's just computation, because the second x partial derivative will be 12x squared, the second y partial derivative will be 12y squared, and the mixed partial derivative, well, the x to the fourth goes away, the y to the fourth goes away, and here we just get uh, negative 36, right? So that means that this term that determines whether we've got a maximum or a minimum or potentially a saddle point, fxx minus fyy minus fxy squared is 12x squared times 12y squared, 144x squared times y squared minus negative 36 squared. Well, negative 36 squared is positive, first of all, so the minus sign stays with us from here, and 36 squared ends up being 1,296. Okay, so now we have to investigate our critical points, and our critical points were 0, 0, 3, 3, and negative 3, 3. Okay, so the value of this expression at 0, 0 is very simple. It's negative 1,296 and that is smaller than zero, and that means we have a saddle point. The value of this expression at 3, 3 
Well, we're going to get the exact value also. Let's see if we can estimate it. 3 squared is 9. 3 squared is 9 here. So we get 81 times 144. That's going to be a whole lot bigger than 1,296. And we're really only interested in the sign. So we realize that this is going to be positive. The exact value is 10,368, which is positive. And therefore, we now check the concavity in the x direction and that is positive so the function is concave up the exact value is 9 times 12 which is 108 and that is greater than 0 and that means we have a relative minimum because the thing is concave up there if you will and for the value of this expression at negative 3 negative 3 well we realize that that's going to be the same value as at 3 3 because the negative signs get squared out so this is 10,368, which means it's greater than zero, which means we want to look at the concavity again in the x direction. The value ends up again being 108, which is greater than zero, and that means that the function has a relative minimum. Now, from what we know about single variable functions, that looks kind of strange, because a function that has a single variable function that has two relative minima has got to have something where it turns around in between. It turns out that for functions of two variables, that need not be the case. You see, this function actually sort of looks like a set of pants where the, the legs are sewn up, and so that is a function that has a relative minimum here, so that's the point negative 3, 3. It has a relative minimum here, that is the point 3, 3. But then where the pants are sewn together in the middle, it has a saddle point, and so that saddle point makes the knee makes it unnecessary for the function to have a local maximum in between the two local minima, which is another nice geometric insight here, which is that certain instincts that we have developed and that work very well for functions of one variable no longer will necessarily be accurate. Now we should certainly still follow these instincts and when something looks kind of funny to us we need to investigate further but then certainly graphing this function with a three with a piece of three-dimensional graphing software certainly re, um, will then then um, calm our minds with respect to the fact that that may have looked a little funny two relative minima without a maximum in between to wrap things up for functions with more than two variables, there is also a second derivative test for functions of more than two variables. However, we would need the notion of positive definiteness from linear algebra to state it. Basically, we would set up the same kind of matrix with all the possible mixed partial derivatives that we can have, and then that matrix would have to satisfy a certain property, and that is the property of being positive definite, which takes quite a while to explain and is better done in a linear algebra class. So we're not going to go in that direction, so that means basically this is where we stop. Um, basically, the things that you can do for this, um, for this section, and notice it's, it's gotten kind of dark around here, you can only see my face on the camera right now, that's just, that's just that the sun's been going down, the recording took a little longer than I expected. But basically, what you can do here, what you want to take with you from this presentation is to find relative maxima and minima, you set the gradient equal to zero, and then you apply the second derivative test where you have this fxx, fyy minus fxy squared. That determines whether your concavities go in the same direction and whether the warp overcomes the concavities. And if that is not the case, then you just use the fact whether it's concave up or concave down along any of the axes to determine whether the function has a, let's see, concave up would be a minimum, concave down would be a maximum, so whether the function has a relative maximum or a minimum. There is not much else that can be explained here except that, of course, the computations can and do get rather nasty, but that is something that we can handle with practice, and for you it is time to practice that a bit. We're going to talk about how to use uh, the relative extrema and then also this idea of an absolute extrema to actually solve optimization problems more sophisticated but otherwise very similar to the optimization problems that we have handled in single variable calculus. But right now 
First, get familiar with this stuff. I'll see you in the next presentation.